Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on how to cultivate a stronger supply chain. My name is Michael Power. I'm the editor of Supply Professional Magazine. Uh, we're joined today by our panelists. Uh, please welcome our speakers from Barcoding Canada and Honeywell, Rock Gilbo, Channel Business Manager at Honeywell, Dan Zawicki, Marketing Director at Honeywell, and Peter Zielinski, Director of Partner Solutions at Barcode. For today's webinar, we'll aim to uh, wrap up in about 45 minutes to an hour. If you have any questions during the conversation, please type them into your question box in the control panel and we'll uh, answer them at the end of the webinar. Quick note about Barcode in Canada. Barcoding is your local partner for mobile computing, automated data capture, and labeling and printing. Their experts have decades of experience working with enterprise customers. They excel in delivering efficiency, accuracy, and great service. Honeywell Safety and Productivity Solutions, SPS, provides product software and connected solutions that improve productivity, workplace safety, and asset performance for their global customers across the globe. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn things over to uh, our first speaker, Peter. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, how do we cultivate a stronger supply chain? Well, really, we're all talking about better data for decision making. And we're going to illustrate that to get us started with uh, the, the industry evolution. If you think about where we're at right now, we're, we're entering and uh, advancing through Industry 4.0. And, and that's highlighted by digital transformation and connected systems. Now, most organizations uh, view item information in north-south directions, silos that they've created within their organization. Um, in order to do that well, you need accurate data. But in order to advance your supply chain east and west across both your suppliers and the people you're supplying, you need better data, better quality data. Um, and the GS1 standards, which is that balloon over to the right, um, enables organizations to think in terms of east and west as well because it creates a shared vocabulary and a common language for communication and data exchange to connect to that greater supply chain. I'm gonna be talking today about some of the stepping stones uh, and how we're stepping forward from 1.0 to our industry 4.0. And I'm going to highlight uh, the past, present, and future of the supply chain. So if you think about uh, industry 1.0 solutions before the barcode, it was pretty much stencils on boxes. And the warehouse of the past was one in which you really had to know where the product was by physically knowing where the product was because you were the one who put it away. Uh, as we advance forward, we start talking about where we are today in 2019 and 2020, just our recent past, to get an idea as to what things were like before the pandemic and where we were going, and then the impact of the pandemic on that situation and what's happened since then. So in 2019 and 2020, we were trending towards omni-channel, and we were running pretty lean for our inventories. There was a plethora of cargo containers available. Rail, truck and warehouse space were all going fairly well, advancing at a reasonable clip and expanding globally. If you needed to ship from anywhere to everywhere, starting to get into that omni-channel platform. What I mean by that is companies were starting to adapt and deal with the Amazon effect because people were starting to get used to the idea of ordering things online and getting them shipped on demand to their house overnight or close to overnight. Back in 2020, about 15% or less of all shoppers were willing to buy online, but that market was growing. With that circuit of supply and warehouses and things running fairly lean or just in time, uh, things were expanding at a fairly good clip. Then COVID happened. We saw a result of a cascade of global shutdowns combining with a sudden surge in demand for essential items like toilet paper, oxygen, ventilators, and cleaning supplies. We also had a, a demand surge for comfort foods like frozen tater tots and french fries and pizzas because people were trapped at home during the shutdown and they wanted those comfort foods. So at the supply chain, we started seeing this, this sudden gap as the grocery shelves emptied and uh, filling up that supply chain was, was a serious problem. E-commerce, home delivery, curbside delivery, buy in line and pick up in store, 
These are all things that have become very common nowadays. If the item's in stock and a customer wants it, you'd better find a way to get it to them as efficiently and accurately as possible, or they'll go elsewhere and find it, and they never have to leave their homes to shop. Online shopping went from 50% of all shoppers to 60% almost overnight. The Amazon effect went from jet propelled to rocket propelled. Walmart, Target, and any retailer with a good online presence was suddenly sold out of fitness equipment, and entrepreneurs were working to profit on the shortages through Amazon and Craigslist. If you have the capital, you're rapidly applying technology to improve your operations and make better use of your resources to try to meet that demand. And we've seen a huge increase in technology adoption rates over the past two years. One estimate that I've seen is that we've had 10 years worth of planned technology adoptions happening within two. And better data quality is key to all of that. Uh, we've also had a number of supply chains disruptions that were not due to COVID-19 such as this wonderful jackknifed cargo container in the Suez Canal. One of the estimates I saw from that for damages and losses was over $1 billion just because of one cargo ship that got jackknifed. So if you had a lean inventory prior to COVID, you are likely experiencing a serious demand spike that cannot be met. Orders are being made and then canceled because you can't deliver on deadline because your stuff is still out at sea or hasn't even been shipped yet. The 30, 60, 90 rule is becoming the 20, 240, and 360. So now you're on the phone trying to track down where your supplies are at. Pent up demand is uh, suffering from that bullwhip caused by plant shutdowns and the rolling COVID related absences at the front lines. Essential workers are taking the brunt of the problem, first with the shutdowns, now with the demand surge. And that has been having ripple effects throughout our economy. Let's talk a little bit about that bullwhip effect. The COVID related effects revealed all of our blind spots and everyone is still reeling from that, that effect of the shutdowns and the demand surges. Uh, for want of more chips, the automobile production lines have ground to a halt in the US. They've got cars out there that are incomplete uh, they, because they don't have any computers to control them. Uh, until those chips arrive, no new cars can be completed. Demand is up after the shutdown. So the price of used cars is shot up and availability is shot down. Uh, ripples can be felt in the rental car and travel industry as well. And in mid-September, there were more than 65 cargo vessels off the coast of California waiting for a docking space to unload. Usually this is a well-orchestrated sequence of expected ships arriving to be unloaded without a wait. And this bodes rather poorly for the Christmas shopping season. Uh, expect a late delivery for everything and prepare to see a lot of gift cards under the tree. That was 65 cargo vessels back in mid-September. This is now early October, and I think that number has risen to 100. So there's a lot of challenges happening currently in the supply chain. And there's one more challenge on the horizon, consumer demand and increased regulation. Now, these are actually good things, but they have a, a ripple effect on the supply chain because of the demands for more better data and more information. These are end-to-end -end traceability initiatives rocking both the uh, food and beverage industry and the drug supply chain uh, for pharmaceuticals and medical devices. The Food Safety Modernization Act is asking for lot level, container level traceability from the field or the boat, as in the case of seafood, all the way down to the consumer. And the whole purpose of this is to make sure that our supply chain for food is safe and to keep bad things from happening stopping any contamination or problems within the food supply chain before it reaches people. Uh, same sort of thing is true for traceability initiatives for the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, otherwise known as the DSCSA. Uh, the Drug Supply Chain Security Act is already in effect and is rolling out now and it's expected to be complete by 2023 with dosage level traceability down to the patient level. The Food Safety Modernization Act is still uh, in design. They are now asking for people to submit proposals for meeting these requirements. But again, what they're looking for is a lot level traceability at the container level all the way through the supply chain. So how is the supply chain responding to all of these recent challenges? Let's take a look at the next slide. Primarily, they're looking for solutions for agility and resilience. In the past, if you've got time to set up automation, you can put in a fixed automation system and smooth out a known workflow. Because of the bullwhip effect, the known workflow is changing on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis. And in order to manage that, you really need to have resilience and agility and enable your frontline workers to be able to respond to changing situations. 
the order came in on a Friday. It's got to ship out by Monday. Oh, and by the way, Monday morning, the order changed. So a lot of things are, are on the fly changing before the product goes out the door. One of the solutions to this is big data and better software for planning, supplier collaboration and integrated demand planning solutions to improve this agility and flexibility by doing better forecasting. Because we know historical forecasting is pretty much out the window right now due to the bullwhip effects. We don't know exactly what the demand is, only that it's going to be high. So by using demand sensing and other connected systems to try to get ahead of this information curve, the enterprise is trying to get more information so that they can do better planning for the orders and get that inventory into the right place to meet the right order at the right time. However, the real crunch right now is labor, getting, retaining, and supporting the people who do the work and help manage that demand. And we're doing that by adding mobility. Next slide, please. Um, mobile applications and mobile devices are filling the gaps for essential work and enabling people to be more productive and agile in the face of changing requirements and rapidly evolving situations. So if you look around here, you're gonna see a couple different things. We're seeing modernized platforms for mobility instead of Windows TE environments. We're now seeing Android or full desktop Windows environments that support a more rich user experience than the old Telnet scenarios we had in the past. It's really all about creating an ecosystem of workflows and supporting technology rather than that one ring to rule them all approach. So within an organization, each silo is getting a different technology stack to support their operations rather than one stack to support them all. So you're seeing voice enabled applications for picking and fulfillment. You're seeing mobile printing to allow them to put labels on products as they're picking them to make sure that they go to the right customer at the right time. And you're seeing devices that are specific to that particular workflow, either a handheld industrial type gun for situations where scanning involves a lot of uh, rough and tumble or a pocket, a shirt pocket type format where it's more phone based and people are used to using a, a GUI environment or maybe even a wearable uh, that can include augmented reality and virtual reality glasses to help you to direct the activity where it needs to be using information available across the board from the whole system. So Android modernization has accelerated, enabling operations to take advantage of multiple applications on that same device instead of the dedicated one app solutions of the past. Supply chain woes are making that transition to new hardware a little bit more difficult, however, so they need other solutions too. These investments are in ecosystems and not in monolithic platforms. So let's take a look at some more modernization examples, things that are happening in warehouses today that go beyond just the mobile components. In the next slide, we're gonna be talking about real-time location systems. What do I mean by that? Well. The situation we see here is a fork truck driver approaching a pallet. If we know where the fork truck is, and we know where that pallet is located, and we know that there's sensors on that truck that can indicate whether that pallet has been lifted up or put down or whether that fork truck is in motion, all of these different events allow us to use what they call a real-time location system to make use of that known information to record events within the ERP or WMS. So if we know what's on the unit pallet and we know where that pallet is currently located, we can associate that with the lift truck's activity and that known information in real time. And that's happening today. Plus, fork driver safety is one of the number one concerns in the warehouse. Keeping his hands on the wheel by using real-time location systems is one way of ensuring that safety. Knowing where the fork is at all times enables a system that avoids collisions with other equipment and other vehicles. And there's a host of other safety features that can be built out from that starting point. But it keeps the driver's hands on the wheels and gives them accurate traceability for all the products and people in their warehouse. Now, robots in the warehouse have been a dream from probably years and years and years ago. If you remember the old Warner Brothers cartoons, you know, watching robots move around and do everything. Well, this is kind of the dream, that dark warehouse where there's no people, just machine that's moving the goods around. The reality is somewhere in between that previous uh, people-centric vision of the warehouse and this one. All of this technology is built on GS1 standards at the core if it's designed to support the supply chain. You need to be able to identify, capture, share, and use that information. And robotics does have a place, but dark warehouses are only a concept for now. Agility and resilience are being created by combining people and automation in the same place, cooperatively joined. 
And this is possible because of edge computing and mobile automation, as well as a lot of machine learning. So if we take a look at the next slide, we'll talk about some of the real life examples that are happening today. We're really talking about a goods to person or a goods to process automation system. They can be either fixed infrastructure, such as the, uh, the shuttle-based system you see in that little inset picture with the red robots running around, um, or it could be autonomous guided vehicles or autonomous mobile robots that are picking up product and bringing it to someone at the pick face or bringing the pick face to the person who's doing the fulfillment. Either way, you need to invest in a warehouse manufacturing control and execution systems. WES is warehouse execution system, WCS is a warehouse control system, and MES is a manufacturing execution system or a manufacturing control system. Again, the whole idea here is you need infrastructure and machine logic built around this to coordinate and orchestrate this type of automation. But the benefits of this are uh, a much faster to value solution than a conveyor-based system. It's much more flexible, and you're reducing worker travel time to and from the storage locations. That's really key to this solution. So a lot of time that's spent in the warehouse is going from one place to the other and not doing anything. You're just trying to walk to get to the next site to pick a product. Or you're carrying product from site to site to site, wearing out your back, wearing out your shoes, wearing out your body. Um, in order to do a fulfillment operation, where if you had a cobot, you could just offload this, equ this equipment or these products that you're picking onto the cobot. When the order is complete, one cobot heads off down to the packing line, another cobot comes in to help you continue for the next set of orders. Companies are turning to this type of technology to improve their abil uh, ability to respond to changes in their orders and to move beyond just people in the warehouse. Now, we haven't talked much about RFID and IoT, and these are part of the technology stack that supports all of these types of technologies. Um, RFID allows us to read a multitude of products information at once, and IoT can be used to allow products literally to communicate with the supply chain with no human interference mm -hmm. to record events as they happen. These technology stacks support the supply chain by providing real-time or near real-time information for better decision-making. But the agility is really all about improving that user experience and making your workers more productive, more effective, and safer. So let's take a look at that slide one more time. Improving that user experience can reduce downtime, increase accuracy and throughput, reduce ergonomic strains, and enable better employee safety for job satisfaction. All of these things improve retention and reduce turnover. Modernization is one of those improvements, moving from green screens and CE devices to touchscreen-centric GUI applications on a multimodal Android device. When I say multimodal, what I mean is they're not just using this device to receive information and post information uh, via keying things in or scanning barcodes. They're using this to coordinate their day, to coordinate and communicate with other people in the enterprise as well as just make use of that device in every possible way they can to get the most value out of it. Sometimes taking a closer look at the tech stack and removing friction, the data, application, and network is issues that waste time and reduce efficiency is one of those things you can do to improve that status quo. And that comes in, in the face of using mobile systems intelligence to take a look at the entire tech stack from where the user experience is all the way back into the system that's trying to direct and redirect that user experience. There are some gaps within that technology stack, and by having the right monitoring tools over the top of that, you can improve the user experience by taking away those gaps, taking away the dead time or the downtime caused by problems where the communications just kind of fails within the system. For example, and I'm, I'm probably getting deep into the weeds on this one for some of our audience, but if you've been in the IT room and you've seen them hear that the end user is having to reboot their device because it's not responding properly. The IT department often doesn't know what's happening that causes the device to fail or to, to pause or stutter. It could be a multitude of things, whether it's the Wi-Fi connection, uh, missing data within the uh, infrastructure stack. Um, it, it could just be a loose key on the device. But until they have more information, they can't support that end use worker. Mobile systems intelligence solutions allow them to look at the entire tech stack and eliminate and find uh, root cause problems that can be eliminated to reduce those problems. 
Last thing I want to mention, voice-enabled workflows and augmented reality are solutions today. We're seeing operations pivot to voice and vision to create a hands-free workflow. They're seeing huge benefits for reducing time to value for onboarding and processing their improvements. And voice and vision solutions can ride on top of existing Android mobile applications and add robotic process automation and workflow improvements. And with that, I'd like to hand the discussion off to one of our friends at Honeywell, uh, Rock Gibbo. Rock, take it away. The next slide is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter, for that lead in. I think you you touched upon a couple of of uh, things that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be getting a little deeper into the more pragmatic side of things. And really, uh, thank you for changing to the next slide. <laughs> um, talking about the supply chain, we've talked a lot about the supply chain. The supply chain is really two things. And the supply chain is a physical flow of goods, but it is also, as, as Peter alluded to, it is also an information flow. So to protect, to optimize, and to manage that information flow is as important to the actual physical uh, flow of goods to maintain a high quality of service to the end customers. So I'm gonna be talking about the four pillars of mobile computing, yes, but also the backbone. So what does it take? What are the things you should be looking for to, to optimize uh, your the communication or data flow within the company to every edge location that is where a, a transaction is happening. So there are four really big pillars. The first one, and we'll, I'll get into these a little bit deeper, uh, accelerated deployments, meaning it's easy to be able to scale and to deploy large numbers or small numbers of devices and infrastructure to everywhere that the work is, is taking you. Uh, we need to optimize that business performance to optimize and maximize the use of that technology. We want to also, for reasons I'll get into later, we want to extend the life cycle as long as possible uh, of that device. And we'll talk about what to consider. And then we want to we want to certainly have the strongest possible security. And I'll get into details where security is not only about protecting from outside attacks. So accelerate deployment, what does that mean? So with today's uh, labor shortage challenges, with today's people having to adjust really quickly to demand, especially increase in demand these days, and if you consider that the average cost of deployment of an IT staff is over $700 per device, and that's as per uh, VDC research that does a lot of research in our industry, you need for your platform, you really need a platform that allows you to deploy very easily tools that allow you to validate your configurations, uh, import your software, and then deploy everywhere as quickly as possible, making it as easy as possible. The old days of dropping a device in a in a uh, in a cradle and updating each device uh, individually and configuring each device individually is not just possible. It's, it's just not possible anymore. So a complete set of provisioning tools that increase the speed from the time of acquisition to actually you as a company getting the value from the asset that you just purchased. So some of these types of tools that are available, there's uh, provisioners, there's everybody is probably familiar with zero touch enrollment, which is an Android tool, set up wizards, secure provisioning, staging hubs to help stage that equipment. This is probably the biggest piece, uh, one of the biggest piece, pieces of the actual the actual best practice use of your device network. And, and again, Peter alluded to uh, intellig intelligence tools. So the goal, once you have the, those equipments in the field operating, you wanna maximize their use. You wanna make sure that they do not break down, that they cost you as least as possible. If you know a, st a couple of statistics that are interesting is the average the average uh, cost of one mobile availability availability problem per shift. So what's a mobile availability problem? The battery died. Uh, your connection is not working. You have a bug with your software. The, so the hardware breaks. So one interruption per shift per worker equals about twenty thousand dollars per year. Again, according to VDC research. What kind, so the goal of optimizing is to maximize your workflow, obviously, and 
and optimize and minimize downtimes. There are really four, if you sum up the types of issues that you can have in the field, there are really four. So there, we mentioned them already, uh, hardware damage, network connectivity issues, software issues, or battery failures. And I will add one more because your mobile printers, and Peter talked about that as well, mobile or stationary printers can run out of paper, or run out of ink, or fail. And those can be as costly to your productivity and to your customer, ultimately to your customer satisfaction as anything else. So there are companies who design software tools that streamline and error proof those 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 possible incidences. So a couple of uh, examples, more real life examples are uh, if somebody has their device breaks and they have to walk over to the IT department and then and then walk back. That's a 40 to 60 minute on average IT support. Uh, battery fails or or a one of the people working in the warehouse actually picks up a device that seems to be fully charged, but the device is actually on its la the battery in the device is actually on its last legs, and there's no way to tell without these intelligence tools that that battery is actually going to fail during that shift. So those are the types of issues that this business intelligence, these business intelligence tools, can manage and optimize a complete life cycle and performance of the asset. Keep in mind that uh, just another interesting statistics that the total cost of ownership of a device, say a, um, a $2,000 device, $2,000 is the upfront cost or 20% of what that product is actually gonna cost over the span of its lifetime. So you're looking at 20% cost upfront and the rest is all going to, incur, all the rest of the costs are gonna incur during the life of that uh, asset and you wanna minimize the cost on that asset. Extend life cycle. So when you buy a device that is, two, we'll, we'll keep that price $2,000, probably not uh, ex exact, but it, let's just say it's a good average price for a, a rugged device. What you wanna do is make that device last as long as possible. And there are several ways to look at this. Peter mentioned devices that have the right OS. Uh, previously, if you have been in the warehouse environment for the past 20, 25 years, you know that the Windows operating system was the dominant operating system uh, over that period of time, whether it be with Windows C, Windows Embedded Handheld, or Windows Mobile, or even Pocket PC for those of us who are old enough to remember that. So to have that uh, up-to-date, to have that up-to-date um, OS is obviously key. A lot of people are still running on, on, on OS, but Microsoft discontinued support and security patches, more importantly, on the uh, Windows Mobile device, uh, Windows Mobile OS many, many months ago. So having the right uh, operating system is key. And Android seems to want to fill that commercial and industrial space that was left behind by, by uh, Microsoft. The other consideration when you when you are buying a, an, an edge device or a mobile computer or a vehicle mounted computer and so on, you have to get things that are built to last. We talked about the total cost of ownership before where 20% is your total acquisition cost, but the real cost really comes down the road. And if you're going and you're buying a device that is not made either for your environment or for the second point that is not built or has the tools to do to, to really do the, to perform the workflow adequately and in an efficient and uh, um, stable fashion, then you end up with a lot more additional costs. And that total cost of ownership can climb really, really fast. An example of that is if you have, if you had a FedEx driver that was using a, an iPhone or a, an Android phone, and they had 27 deliveries to do, and after the fifth one, they dropped their device in the puddle of water and the device stops working. Just imagine how many people are gonna be dissatisfied and what the loss of productivity will be there. And by the way, FedEx just does not use consumer devices for their jobs, but I was just using that as an example. And lastly, it's important to have a device that, that provides that unmatched Android forward compatibility. What do I mean by that? Is that you buy a phone or you buy a, uh, a mobile computer with, with Android, let's say we're shipping Android 11 right now. So let's say Android 10 or Android 11, and that device will only go up to Android 12, which means 
and I'll talk about that in the next section, in the security section, but that means that you won't be able to upgrade it to the latest and greatest OS, which can have some security repercussions. So you want a device that going in, when you buy that device, you want at least three, four, or five future iterations guaranteed by the manufacturer that will be providing you that, that mobile computer. Um, and last point I thought was an interesting statistics again by VDC is, is actually extending the life of your device from from five to eight years actually lowers your total cost of ownership over those eight years by over 50%. So if you are able and you are able to do it safely and securely to, to use your device for eight years, uh, you do significantly reduce your cost of ownership. Security, everybody's talking about security in this in the security statistic that pretty much scares everybody, and this is another statistic from VDC, is in 2018 the average cost of a data breach was $3.8 million. And that and I'm not gonna get into the details of that. I'm not going to talk about uh, the different variables that go into security breach. We only have to think of what we hear on the news every day about security breaches and how it impacts customer confidence. Is there something more important than customer confidence and reputation of a company? So just that fact alone is uh, is a huge factor in wanting to protect your data. Now, contrary to what most people believe, most of the quote unquote attacks within four walls do not occur from the outside. Actually, that's half true. 41% of, of attempted hacks are done from the outside through conventional means and 21% actually come in through other systems in the company. And I'll give you an example of a breach and I do not, I can't find the name of the company. There was a company that was actually hacked through, through their HVAC system. Peter talked about IOT. Well, IOT just basically means it puts everything on the internet and hackers are able to hack through uh, other devices than just the computer networks internally, which is why security is so much, so, so, so important. And then the last ones are, in, the last types of uh, security breaches are either internal hackers, actual internal hackers that are trying to steal information from the company, or it could be as simple as a lost or stolen device. So you want to protect these and be able to address these. So what you're looking for, again, we devices that provide the uh, unmatched Android Ford compatibility. Why have that much Ford compat compatibility? It is, it is to have the latest and greatest features, uh, security features that are issued, that are, that are provided by Android. And the only way to fully protect your devices is to update your Android device. Now there are some manufacturers that do offer backporting as a last resort. And, and Honeywell, as an example, does offer security patch backporting. And we, and this is very important to know, it is, there are situations where a company cannot switch or update their OS right away. So they can do some security patch backporting, which means we will take, we have an agreement with Google and we'll get the latest features and adapt them to older versions of Android releases, but that, that is not the ideal situation. We'll do that as a last resort. So somebody who does offer that is, is a good way or good means to, to protect yourself as a last resort. So again, four walls do not offer the protection that you you think it is so for only 41 percent of attacks or it infrastructure attacks come from the outside in summary i just want to mention that everything we described here we uh, honeywell has a product called mobility edge uh, that is exactly what we just highlighted and it, it has been put together by three companies three very serious companies android honeywell and qualcomm again mobility edge is a platform it is a common set of tools it's a hardware software ecosystem, scalable and universally compatible within its product line. And it does meet all the four basic requirements of a stable, strong flow, for a stable, strong flow of information in your supply chain. And just to give you a, uh, a look at what a total platform can look like, 
this is what a total platform can look like. So many mobile rugged devices, all based on Android, but ha but uh, what I talked about earlier, you uh, develop once, you configure once, deploy to many. And that is, next slide please, I think that's it for me. Yep, that was it for me. Hey, thanks Rock and, and Peter as well. This is Stan Zwicky, good afternoon again. And everyone. So, you know, Peter did a really good job framing up sort of the state of the union in the supply chain, some of the challenges. Rock, great job going through some of the mobile computing uh, challenges as well as solutions. I'm going to take a few minutes, uh, as well as try to leave some time at the end for QA here, but uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about voice automations and how that fits into the this, this supply chain. So uh, warehouse and DC throughput has always been critically important, uh, cr a critical component within the supply chain, uh, maximizing that throughput. And um, you know, in today's world with the added uh, issues with labor shortages, supply shortages, and just the need for speed to meet customer expectations, that warehouse DC throughput critical criticality has only increased, right? Um, but it, it's always been important. Uh, I'm going to speak to voice automations and how it really shines in delivering more throughput, particularly in the warehouse DC. It's also applicable to other applications. But uh, at warehouse DC is, is really a great spot uh, for vo voice automations. Not only increased throughput, you also get quality enhancements from that. And the other thing that's really great about it and why we see so many more people adopting it uh, and at an increasingly rate is because it's a relatively low cost and fast return on investment to do so. Uh, it, it rides on top of existing solutions, which again is uh, something that Peter pointed out that, uh, you know, wherever um, companies can quickly make improvements rather than having to do, you know, a, a full blown supply chain or warehouse DC automation, you know, it just makes sense to evolve in that direction rather than uh, you know the much more unlikely case of spending millions and millions of dollars to completely replace or, or retrofit your operations. So uh, when we go ahead and jump in, so uh, Vocalect, now Honeywell Voice Automations, uh, was founded in 1987. So voice automation is not is not new to us anyhow. And we're actually now in our third generation of platforms and something unique that we've done over the years of evolution here and to support our customers is to make sure that our new and older software and hardware are all able to work together so it's for that future proofing so that our customers aren't burdened on, on our popular legacy platform uh, voice artisan and catalyst are the names of those and also the connect we plan to continue this strategy so that regardless of whether you are new to voice or are, are um, migrating, it's easy to adopt and uh, a low hurdle to do so. There it goes. All right. So uh, in addition to working with our previously existing hardware, our newest platform, Guided Work, it opens up new markets and applications for our customers by providing compatibility with other devices and actually an infinite number of workflows. So customers can choose from our prepackaged connector workflows, or they can create their own, right? So we have uh, tools to do this, and I'll describe that a little bit. Uh, they can run them with voice purpose built devices, uh, which would be like the Talkman. Uh, that's the, the image you see in the very far right of this slide. slide. Or, the voice automation can run on a general purpose mobile computer, like what Rock was talking about. And there's pros and cons to each. You know, it's not a one size uh, fits all. There, there's benefits for, for each of them. And, and depending on the situation, well, one makes more sense than the other. Like the name guided work implies, customers can guide their workers through an ad Android application, or they can provide directed work through the Talkman or they can even do both. So this, this platform is, is very flexible. And taking it a, just a closer look at the slide here in this guided work solution, on the left-hand side, you, you see our guided work development kit. This is a development tool, and it's the, it's the 
the tool is used to build the connectors and workflow applications. This is getting you know voice to connect to the, the host and as well as create the workflows. And the same tool, it's the same tool regardless of the type of workflow. And it's the same tool regardless of whether you're using a Talkman, an Android device like Mobility Edge, or an, even an, a consumer device like iOS or a Windows device. Uh, so again, broad compatibility, future-proofing uh, with this guided work solution and uh, provides many options to our, to our customers. So with all the opportunity and technology possibilities in this space, uh, you know, we continue to actually increase our, our R&D investments in voice and voice related technology. Um, and I just wanted to share with you these four different areas that we're focusing on. And you know, here are some examples of the advanced tech that's being done as well. I'll, I'll get into those and in actually that the next couple of slides. We'll walk you through these categories here. First, compatibility. Uh, you know, on the last couple of slides, I talked quite a bit about this, but just building out all the connectors and enhancements and driving more and more compatibility with our third generation platform is something that, that we're heavily investing in and making sure that it's really easy and um, seamless for existing customers to migrate from one platform to the other, as well as making it extremely easy for customers that are new to voice to adopt for the first time. Something a little bit more new that we're investing in, uh, the second bar that you see on, on this chart here is device management and analytics. We already have some tools for this today. We continue to enhance them, as well as building out more uh, cloud-based solutions for them, which makes it, again, easier for our customers to benefit from enhancements that we make over time. And we do continue to have some uh, on-prem solutions as well. Third, market expansions. You know, I, I mentioned Warehouse DC, and uh, there, there are a few very specific Workflows that are that are really common in a warehouse DC. Uh, we continue to add more corner case applications within warehouse DC, but also things like maintenance and inspection and retail, especially uh, e-commerce, where you know buy online, pick up in store, and, and other verticals. We continue to expand the options for the voice solutions and and those workflows. And then perhaps uh, most exciting, the advanced technology areas. Uh, we continue to explore new technologies, invest in them, uh, even though maybe they're not ready, quite ready for commercialization, we invest in them to get them closer to being ready for commercialization and migrate them from you know, tech development to that commercial offering. So uh, let me give you a couple more examples of the advanced tech work that's being done since that's uh, kind of an exciting, fun thing to, to talk about here. So you go to the next slide and I'll walk you through just a few examples here. So again, um, we have our one platform for the future, which is guided work. And I described how that works on, it works with Android, it works with Talkman, and there, there's uh, benefits to each of those. We're also uh, adding onto that platform to be compatible with these future technologies. And I'm just gonna share some examples with you. Uh, so going from left to right on the bottom half of this slide, we're working on what we call a lightweight architecture. And with our lightweight architecture, it just makes it um, possible to have more simple devices and less hardware horsepower. So that means lower cost components, less emphasis on the hardware itself. And the software is doing much more of, of the heavy lifting. So, and that has all sorts of benefits to, uh, to, to our customers, you know, more flexibility, more enhancements over time. So this lightweight architecture is something that, that we continue to, to work on. Uh, robotics, uh, Peter, mentioned robotics, AMRs, and uh, uh, semi-autonomous uh, robots. That is an area that we continue to, to invest in. Actually, I'm going to give you a little more specific example of that in, in just a moment. Uh, Heads-up displays, augmented reality, uh, kind of virtual reality, but mostly augmented reality and heads-up displays is an area that, that we're focusing on. I'll give you an example on that as well. And um, spatial web is something that goes with that, which is just providing more specific direction and locationing with, with sort of AR uh, heads up displays. And then core voice technology, it's shown on the slide here, a speaker independent, but uh, that's, there's actually a lot to this with just core voice technology to further enhance voice recognition uh, that also enables ergonomic improve, improvements with our devices and, and form factors. So just two examples to share a bit more detail. 
we've actually developed working concepts for heads up display and, and spatial web. And with this technology, we can overlay an image of what the worker needs to pick, uh, which helps reduce errors and, in, and of course, increase productivity and, and throughput. We can provide visual instruction for the worker for where um, to locate an item, right where it's at, kind of like almost like a pick to light. And again, further improving productivity. And then once you are actually at the, loca at the location to pick that item, <clears throat> we can uh, put an image up to make, you know, give you that visual to make sure you actually picked the right item, right? Whether that, that's to make sure that you pick the right color, right? You know, is it a brown belt, is it a black belt, or uh, what have you. Another example we have here is in robotics. So robotics actually are not new to us in voice. Uh, we've had, we have robotic divisions in Honeywell and we have been compatible with various robots in, in voice for years. We are, are currently part, partnering with several third parties um, in addition to our internal uh, robotics uh, divisions. And we've developed working concepts that uh, integrate voice with semi-autonomous mobile robots. So for this, envision, for example, uh, your pallet jack or other material handling equipment being guided by your voice, right? So you as a, a warehouse worker or, or whoever can direct your semi-autonomous robot to follow you around or precede you to help uh, uh, facilitate your picking, which is gonna reduce your, your walk time. You know, if you're talking about a pallet jack, you know, it's gonna reduce the amount of times you have to get on and off that pallet jack and again, you know, increase your throughput as well as just uh, personal um, satisfaction and uh, reduce fatigue. So I just wanted to share those as some fun, fun examples. And uh, we'll jump to the last slide here if we go to the next slide. Another thing that, that we're doing that's kind of new in, in the voice space, not so much a technology, but just providing our customers new ways to, to adopt voice. Again, making it easier for customers to adopt for the first time or, or migrate. And this is through how we go to market, offering a voice subscription option. And um, what, this is basically for customers who prefer an operating expense over capital expenditure and those who value improved cash flow. Uh, we'll be offering voices a su subscription, which lowers the upfront investment needed and shifting to a recurring operating expense. So with this, customers have more predict predictability in their expenses, they have better cash flow, and they always have the latest software available to them because it's a service. And we're also including a short-term subscription add-on that makes it easier for customers to deal with seasonality or other spikes in demand, whether it's driven by seasonality or just some uh, anomaly. With a service like this, uh, you can very quickly ramp up without having to make a whole bunch of, of purchases and like perpetual software. Now this gives you the, the ability to easily ramp up and then ramp back down again uh, or you know, keep going at um, at the higher rate. So it, it gives you that flexibility. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff that's going on with voice and uh, hopefully you found that that interesting. I do wanna pause and, and turn it back over to our moderator. We've got eight minutes left and we wanna see if there's any questions that we can answer. Thank you very much for that, everyone. That was uh, certainly an engaging uh, conversation with some great insights. Uh, there are definitely some serious challenges in the supply chain, so it's good to see some of the uh, solutions out there as well. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I'm just going to go through them, and uh, I'll direct the questions to all our panelists for whoever is sort of best suited to uh, answer each one. Uh, one of the questions we had was, with respect to total cost of ownership of devices, uh, do you suggest uh, leasing versus buying? It depends, right? It depends on the the customer needs. If the, the customer values cash and wants to improve their, their cash flow, then that sort of as a service or, or, or leasing, whatever you want to call it, those sorts of options are typically better for them. If you're a company that is more cash rich, and you just prefer to get it all done in in one shot. You know, there's nothing wrong with that either. So it's really a matter of the uh, the customer's 
financial needs and and their preference. Again, not a not a one size fits all or one is always better than the other. It it really depends on the uh, the type of company. What maybe one thing that to add to that, and it's somewhat implied in the question, is what, does does one cost more than the other? Uh, generally speaking, no, uh, because there's those trade offs between cash flow and and upfront cost. Uh, so there's um, yeah there's not a, a a large cost difference in the long run when you're looking at at one versus the other. Uh, this is Peter. I can kind of add to that that leasing option with a for increased cash flow we sometimes call that hardware as a service and we've seen certain aspects of industry that has seasonality to it opting for hardware as a service because they can scale up and scale down and literally get more hardware for their heavy seasons and then return it all uh, for their uh, their lower seasons so if you can get a a, a solution that fits your business needs um, it can not only reduce your upfront costs, but also uh, increase your or decrease your total cost of ownership and allow you some agility and flexibility. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. We have another question from our audience as well. This one is, how does the real-time location system function? Is it a combination of cameras and links back into the ERP system or through specific devices? And once again, that's not towards any specific uh, panelists, but whoever's uh, whoever would like to take that one. Well, I think that one came up in my presentation, so I'll, I'll take a first swing at that one. Uh, truth is there's a number of solutions for that that involve either optical cameras or uh, real-time um, RFID or Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy solutions to set up location beacons um, and, and a network of, uh, of sensors to help identify where a product or a person is within that space. Last known location um, becomes real time if you get a fairly up-to-date update of where that pro product or person is. Uh, hopefully that's helpful for real time location systems. Okay, we've got uh, one or two more uh... A couple more minutes here. Uh, maybe we can quickly go through uh, one or two more questions. Uh, another question we had was, how would all these help with the labor shortage? I, uh, I I'll chime in here. This is, that. Mark. this is Stan. Yeah. yeah. And then I think on the voice side, we have, uh, I think there's a good play for that too. Go for it, Rock. No, I, I was going to encourage Stan to to talk about that, but because because voice is, is, is a lot more yeah. um, through instinct and through listening and hearing and repeating, it's a lot, it's a lot easier to, to train new employees. So uptime from new hire to, to, uh, to, to be able to, to fully function within a warehouse is reduced quite a bit using voice. So that helps with the labor shortage. Hey, can you hear because me? you're losing employees. Yes. Go ahead. You can hear me. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you're doing a great job explaining that, by the way, Rock. But um, so you, th there's what Rock just described. Uh, now, voice also helps with the labor shortage just because of the throughput improvements. Now, you, it's not uncommon to have 20, 30 plus percent throughput improvements when first implementing a a voice solution. So that alone is is enormous. Uh, on top of that, you have turnover, and that's part of what Rock was talking about. With uh, you know, you got uh, people that are coming and going, and with a voice solution, you reduce the amount of time that it takes to train your new employees. They basically put on the headset and they do it what the headset tells them to do. Right? I'm simplifying the technology, but uh, the point is that that new hire comes in. Now they hit the ground running. Your 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 downtime to get someone ramped up is much shorter. Uh, if I can add to that, your your total time to value is much reduced, uh, both with the, the modern Android GUI systems, because it's very similar to the phones that people have in hand, and with voice technology, because uh, getting somebody not only used to your workflows, but highly productive in those workflows in a very short period of time is, is vitally important to reduce that, that cost of, uh, of our uh, reduced workforce. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our, our panelists, Peter, Rock, and Stan, for sharing your insights. 
Uh, also, thanks to the audience for your time and uh, attention today. You should receive a recording of the webinar in the next day or two. Uh, if you don't, please reach out to me and I'll make sure that you get one. Uh, my email address is michael at supplypro.ca. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks again and uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone.